the alt right is garbage. It's not exactly original garbage either. It's just a modern repackaging of classic white nationalist ideas, but it has undeniably brought back the more overt versions of racism, fascism, sexism, all the fun stuff. Let's cut to the chase. I know why you're here. You read the video title, you know I'm blaming video games. So before we get started, I just want to go over a few disclaimers. Disclaimer one, this is not a PewDiePie thing. Not necessarily that I don't think he's a bad person because he is, but more that this problem is broader. However, I do have some PewDiePie thoughts, so do put a pin in that. Disclaimer two, I still play video games now. I played them a lot as a child, and even as my hand-eye coordination rapidly deteriorates, I still play them fairly regularly. And the fact that I'm starting to find them problematic doesn't mean I'm going to stop playing them. No ethical consumption under capitalism and all that. Disclaimer 3, I'm going to talk about video games as a sort of monolith as video games containing violence. I am aware of exceptions such as FIFA or Portal that aren't violent, but most video games are violent, about 85% according to the American Psychological Association. But for now, let's go ahead and put a pin in that. We'll bring that up toward the end. Part 1. The Cycle My whole theory is not really simple thing bad, but rather three separate things sort of bad makes one really bad thing in combination with one another. Let's list those off real quick, and then I'll explain each one in greater detail. Problem 1. Most video games are centered around and reinforce the concept of violence without consequences. Thing 2. Video games are designed by nature to be a never-ending loop of entertainment and endorphin rushes, addictive to some extent, and more importantly, never-ending. Problem 3. The economic conditions of video game consumption and development create an audience that is disproportionately white and male. Problem 1. Let's do it live! Guess who's back it ain't a fucking question They know the name out when the presence of a living man What you heard is not the murder you will need protection So it's a blind and cut and see so if you need it You get direction The violence without consequence thing in video games is fairly obvious. Player characters don't die, they have respawns or multiple lives. By contrast, the enemy is a faceless horde, and the medium of video games arguably does not allow that horde to be humanized in any way. I'm more interested in how the violence is uniquely inconsequential in comparison to, say, Michael Bay's Transformers or the Marvel movies. A superhero movie like The Avengers has a lot of the same tropes. A faceless horde, goals that can only be achieved through violence, and so on. The difference is, a superhero's goals are still clearly defined. There may be no consequences as far as the harm caused by the violence, but there is a positive benefit for the superhero, saving the world, getting the girl, etc. This is far from being a good thing, but it is a consequence. Compare that to a single-player game, where the characters in the story often have similar goals and ambitions to a superhero, but there's a disconnect between the violence, which is committed by the player in gameplay, and the goals and ambitions, which are achieved by the character in story. This fundamental disconnect between story and gameplay creates a world in which the violence doesn't even have positive consequences. As for multiplayer games, they usually don't even have the sort of story component. The only goals are abstract, like get the most kills or capture the flag. Pro problem 2 People have literally died playing video games because they've got to, got to, got to eat, sleep, etc. Obviously this is an extremely rare occurrence, but it does get at a unique issue that other mediums don't necessarily have. Movies, books, and even TV shows have clearly defined endpoints where the experience is over. Video games are supposed to go on forever, and in fact, the quality of addictiveness is the primary measure in how video games are usually measured critically. Whether it's eliminating lone screens to reduce passive time within the experience, filling an open world with collectibles, or creating new game plus modes for replayability, most game innovations are designed to increase the amount of time a player spends in the game. Even games with a fairly linear gameplay, defined endpoints, and a lack of post-story content are designed specifically to be endlessly replayable. Mass Effect is a movie-like game in that it uses cinematic techniques to create a story-driven experience, 
But its inherent design hook is that the story can be played over and over again to experiment with the different deviations of its branching story outcomes. By most critical definitions, the perfect video game is one that never bores and never ends. Problem 3 hey, fellas, Look what I found in my pocket! Look! A year's salary right here! See what I call them? Fun coupons! See that? A fun coupon! I'm on the sloop zombie. White dudes in society got it made. They've got the most money, least discrimination, so on and so forth. If you disagree, fuck off, you're wrong. Gaming's an expensive hobby in comparison to, say, watching a movie. When you watch a movie, go to the theater, buy a ticket, sit down, watch the movie, etc. Playing a video game requires you to have a widescreen TV, a gaming console, usually an internet connection, and don't even get me started on PC gaming. If you look at video game developers, these two facts kind of stack on each other. Because white people are more likely to be able to afford video games, they're more interested in becoming developers. And because becoming a video game developer requires an education, white people are more likely to be able to get that education because they have all the money to start with. You take creators who are mostly white and male, consumers who are mostly white and male, and a capitalist system that disincentivizes risks, and what you get is art that mostly appeals to white males. At best, you usually get a sort of generic game story along the lines of God of War, which is essentially just a power fantasy with some sexual appeal fantasy sprinkled in. At worst, you get Call of Duty and its copycats, which actively fetishize the military, military intervention, guns, mindless consumerism, etc. Yes, a lot of this does not apply to Nintendo games. Put a pin in that. I will get back to it. These three things alone individually are on some level problematic, but not necessarily catastrophic. It's the combination of them that is essentially unintentional brainwashing. In the world of video games, violence has no consequence, and usually this violence is being inflicted on a faceless horde, whether that be terrorists, the Reapers, or Goombas. This faceless violence is usually lumped in with conservative viewpoints like military fetishism, gun fetishism, and sexual objectification of women. Video games are inherently a more influential medium on a subconscious level because of the interaction. Movies are an inherently passive experience, while video games, the player themselves, is simulating the violence, simulating the sex and power fantasy. A two-hour movie that is problematic is simply that, a two-hour experience. A 200-hour video game, which is also, as I mentioned, a more inherently active experience, becomes this essentially unintentional brainwashing. Then you have the element of online interaction. You have all these unintentionally brainwashed white dudes interacting with similar unintentionally brainwashed white dudes. The only things they really have in common are these worldviews, which have been repeatedly forced fed to them, and meme culture, which we'll get to. Put a pin in that. Given the worldview of these video games and the communities they created, extending that to the real world was the only logical conclusion from there. Part 2. Gamergate it's pretty much impossible to talk about video games creating the alt-right without talking about Gamergate in specific, the original events that created the connection between the two. Gamergate was ostensibly about ethics and video games journalism. It should be abundantly obvious with a few years of hindsight that it was about angry, privileged white kids being angry about having their worldviews challenged. I recommend both the folding ideas and Innuendo Studios videos on the topic. I'll be borrowing from folding ideas in specific. In Dan's video, he breaks down the strategic detail of how Gamergators went about their harassment campaign. What's important to the note is the two things he observes. One, the militaristic language when assigning target designations to harassment victims such as Zoe Quinn and Anita Sarkeesian, and two, the justification used to take those actions that were in a vacuum, clearly morally reprehensible even to those committing the crimes. I don't think it's hard to see how this connects to the toxic viewpoint enforced in the cycle I outlined in part one. Gamergate is simply an extension of the same bigotry and extremist thinking that had thrived in Xbox Live Voight chats for at least a decade. Gamergate was not so much the birthplace of the alt-right, but a crystallization of that event. Breitbart was founded in 2007, 
just before Barack Obama birther conspiracies began. Those same conspiracies peaked in 2011, the same year Obama revealed his long-form birth certificate and the same year r slash poll was launched on 4chan. Gamergate in 2014 served two purposes. One, it revealed to a relative fringe group that there was an untapped audience for their burgeoning movement. Two, it created the modern coalition between explicitly political forces like Breitbart and reactionaries like Milo Yiannopoulos working in cooperation to inflame Gamergaters within the movement. Part 3. Loose Ends Pins 1 and 5. PewDiePie and Meme Culture Just like with Gamergate, I can't really ignore PewDiePie and his connection to the Christchurch shootings either. There have been other white nationalist mass shooters before, but he was the first to explicitly reference alt-right meme culture. He streamed his shooting online with a camera setup that very much resembled a first-person shooter video game. His manifesto references video games at least once, sarcastically referring to Spyro and Fortnite as radicaling influences. The famous Navy SEAL Reddit copypasta makes an appearance in the manifesto. This illustrates the relationship between meme culture and video game culture. They're not the same thing, but they are closely related. PewDiePie is more of a symptom of this relationship than necessarily the cause of this relationship. The core justification the shooter gave was the Great Replacement, a thoroughly debunked theory that white people are being bred out of existence by immigrants. The reason itself is more or less besides the point. Once thoroughly debunked, the alt-right will just find another reason to justify the extermination of other races. I do, however, want to share this one excerpt from the manifesto because it's relevant to what we're talking about. This is what the Christchurch shooter said when justifying the murder of children. It will be distasteful. It will be damaging to the soul. But you know it is necessary, and any invader you spare, no matter the age, will one day be the enemy your people must face. Better for you to face them now than your kin to face them in the future. Leave no viper's nest unburned. Just like the Flood and Halo were helpless to Master Chief's power and might, so are the children of immigrants. But just like the Flood, the shooter's worldview holds their children must be extinguished to accomplish a white ethnostate. Violence is always justified, because it is without consequence. Pin 2. Nonviolent Video Games I sort of implied earlier that non-violent video games were essentially non-existent. It's definitely not true. Games like FIFA and Tetris are all-time bestsellers. Hashtag not all video games. Some of them certainly have their own problematic subtext, but most of them, like Tetris, are sort of like a Jackson Pollock painting. Whatever subtext there is is too vague to be problematic in a political sense. Pin 4. Nintendo Nintendo games don't really have the white male problem necessarily, because they're mostly trying to appeal to either a global audience, or with their smaller titles, a Japanese audience. Their storytelling tends to be in big, broader strokes. That said, Mario and Zelda are Rescue the Princess narratives, essentially sex and power fantasies, but child-friendly. There is a similar problematicness to them, but much less so just because of the generalized audience. Pin 3. Gaming is cheaper. A lot of the problems I've mentioned are getting better, specifically with the economics. Indie games are a lot more viable. Steam sales mean that you can buy newer-ish games about a year after they come out at a much more affordable price. Now that gaming has been around for a while, you can get a PS2 or even a PS3 if you're lucky at a garage sale. As the economic barriers erode, things are going to get better. Which leads me to... Part 4. Conclusion. A lot of what I talked about was at its peak in the seventh generation of consoles, where military-themed shooters dominated the market, and the gaming zeitgeist as a whole was at its absolute peak Dude Bro, peak Mountain Dew Code Red, peak Doritos. The eighth generation is an improvement. Overwatch and Fortnite have their own unique issues to deal with in regards to socially responsible subtext, but they represent a massive improvement over the jingoistic military warship and gun-fetishizing narratives of Call of Duty and Medal of Honor. It's become a running joke in the 8th generation that every critically acclaimed video game story is about fatherhood. As the old guard of white male developers gets older, they're becoming more interested in telling more mature and nuanced stories. Even if a gazillion stories about fatherhood is not exactly diverse, 
It's a massive step up from power and sex fantasies of stereotypical game storylines of old. A large part of this improvement is thanks to the influx of serious art criticism in recent years. Video games have gotten away with recklessly irresponsible subtext and disclusion in large part because the discourse around video games until very recently was obsessed with the question of whether video games were art at all. Now that we've mostly moved past this, we can treat it as serious art and critique it as such. Birth of a Nation was influential in rebirthing the Ku Klux Klan in 1915 but it didn't invalidate the entire medium of film. A similar evolution in how we experience and critique video games will hopefully tamper down on the worst of it. The next evolution of critique of video games is probably the most important. We are at a point where single-player cinematic experiences are critiqued as serious art, but we rarely, if ever, see multiplayer-oriented experiences get the same treatment. The next step is critiquing video games is not just adopting the language of cinematic analysis, but understanding the components that form the subtext of a game like League of Legends. Even in a game with essentially no story outside of lore and cinematic shorts, a majority of the audience will never see creative decisions, create subtext, and project a worldview. This includes the inputs and actions a player makes through their character, the aesthetic design of the characters themselves, and the art style. The most important component to this is how they choose to administrate the online experience itself. The community of a multiplayer game is its most essential component. Interactions between players is the core experience of most multiplayer games, and the community rules and how well those rules are enforced is the game's most essential subtext. How much information a player is physically capable of communicating is a choice, as well as how many resources the company is willing to commit to creating a pleasant experience for its players. I would go so far as to argue legislation should be passed requiring companies to diligently administrate the online interactions on their platforms to stop hate speech. Taking massive profits and subscription fees, game sales, and microtransactions is a privilege, not a right. Most game studios will make decisions strictly on maximizing profit, and frankly won't invest adequate resources in preventing hate speech on their platforms unless they are forced to by law. Fictional violence is not inherently evil, but it should be taken seriously. Art evokes emotion and changes perspective, otherwise there would be no point in doing it. Games like Undertale and Firewatch show there is much more to be done with the medium than point a gun and shoot. It is, like most things, more about holding the corporate money lords accountable for their actions than trying to stomp out a million hateful individuals. This has been a Chumpy Video production, hopefully the first of any. Thank you for watching.